Good morning. Welcome to the Not So Daily Office. Uh, it's good to be with you this morning. You might notice that Casey and I have upped our video game a little bit, so uh, we'll just start feeling this out. And I apologize in advance if our technological ineptitude uh, harshens this experience in any way. So today I want to talk to you about wisdom. See, uh, really the difference between technique and wisdom. And what I mean is, take this for an example or an illustration. When you start learning to play an instrument, uh, you learn a lot of technique. You learn where to put your fingers, you learn how the scales go, and you do a lot of exercises that, that sound musical, but aren't really. They aren't songs. Now, you may not know this about me, but I was once a professional musician. I was a lead guitarist in various country bands in New England and Tennessee and Texas and traveled all over doing that kind of thing. And there's a big difference between the technique you learn in playing scales or arpeggios, if you're a musician yourself, there's a big difference between that and what happens when you get on stage with a band. Because when you get on stage with a band and you're in a live setting, especially if you're doing something that's a little more improvisational, you can't just play scales and arpeggio. You can't just rely on technique. You have to rely on musicianship. You have to blend in with the band. You have to listen. You have to know when to play this note, when not to play this note, when to play that scale or that run or to do a lick based on this sort of set of chords or things like that. There's a lot more going on than just musical technique, what your fingers are doing. There's musicianship, or what we, what we might call wisdom. Now we're going to read today from Job 28. And in Job 28, he's basically talking about the difference between technique and wisdom. And it isn't an abstract exercise for Job, because there's a sense in which human beings could seek to gain technical control over the world. In his world, and in this passage we're going to read, that has a lot to do with mining, actually. The way we, we mine mountains and put them to use and cut rock and use rock to build. In our day, it's things like science or uh, epidemiology, which is part of science, or public policy. All these different uh, scientific levers or technical levers that we pull to try and make the world do what we want the world to do. To make this place into the place we want it to be. But what Job is going to show us today is that um, there is something that transcends all that technique. That without this thing, without this wisdom that transcends technique, our technique is ultimately worthless. We can make all the right policy moves. We can make all kinds of scientific discoveries and invent all sorts of inventions and new medicines and things of that nature. But without wisdom, those things will fall short. They won't create the kind of world that we want to see. So, okay, let's talk about, let's read Job. I'll say just a few more things after, then we'll go to prayer. So this is Job 28. Surely there is a mine for silver, and a place for gold that they refine. Iron is taken out of the earth, and copper is smelted from the ore. Man puts an end to darkness, and searches out to the farthest limit, the ore in gloom and deep darkness. He opens shafts in a valley away from where ever anyone lives. They are forgotten by travelers. They hang in the air far away from mankind. They swing to and fro. As for the earth, out of it comes bread, but underneath it is turned up as by fire. Its stones are the place of sapphires, and it has dust of gold. The path no bird of prey knows, and the falcon's eye has not seen it. The proud beasts have not trodden it, the lion has not passed over it. Man puts his hand to the flinty rock, and overturns mountains by the roots. He cuts out channels in the rocks. And his eyes see every precious thing. He dams up the streets so that they do not trickle. And the thing that is hidden he brings out to light. But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its worth. 
and it is not found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not in me, and the sea says, it is not with me. It cannot be bought for gold, and silver cannot be weighed as its price. It cannot be valued in gold of Ophir, in precious onyx or sapphire. Gold and glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of crystal. The price of wisdom is above pearls. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. From where then does wisdom come? And where is the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Abaddon and death say, We have heard a rumor of it with our ears. God understands the way to it, and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he gave to the wind its weight and apportioned the waters by measure, when he made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of the thunder, then he saw it and declared it. He established it and searched it out. And he said to man, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding. We are at a particularly fraught moment in history. We are dealing with a pandemic, and we are dealing with what for all intents and purposes could be a new civil rights movement. And as human beings, our tendency is to apply technique to these situations, to do the research, to come up with the treatments and the plans and the guidelines and the vaccines for the pandemic, to put all the right public policies into place with respect to civil rights and, and all of that. And I'm not saying those are bad things. I'm not saying we shouldn't do those things. But shorn of wisdom, those technical solutions to the apparent problems of our day will always fall short. We can seek matters out in our own strength, in our own technical insights, but we will never truly get to the bottom of them. Because at the bottom and behind and beneath and above rests the God who made all things, the God whose wisdom permeates all things. So yes, let's seek technical solutions to our problems. But more importantly, and before and behind all that, let's seek the wisdom of God that comes only from the fear of God. I'm not talking about servile fear, where we cower in a corner, afraid to even talk to God, but filial fear, the fear of a son for his father, this loving sense of awe that knows that this being is, in, in God's case, in every respect, greater than we are. To fear the Lord, that's the beginning of wisdom, the Bible says. To turn from evil, that is true understanding. And we thank God that in Christ, who is the wisdom of God incarnate, 1 Corinthians tells us, that God's wisdom has drawn near. And Jesus, as the ultimate God-fearer, the one who fears God in all the right ways, even when we hadn't, he comes near to us to show what that fear looks like and what to show what true wisdom looks like. And because we know him, because our faith is in him, because we dwell in him, we can fear the Lord as we ought and walk in the wisdom that he has so graciously bestowed to us. So I'm going to pray now, and I'm going to encourage you as always, share your prayer requests, and we'll pray for them as they, as they come up. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have sent your only Son, and he has become for us knowledge, wisdom, righteousness, holiness, sanctification, redemption, salvation. Lord, you tell us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we confess that in ourselves and apart from your grace, 
in our sin, we do not fear you as we ought. But we thank you that you've come to us. And you've trained us to see that that fear is not the type of fear that we are accustomed to in the use of the word, but it's, it's loving fear. It's a relationship between father and son, father and daughter, family. Father, we look at the problems in our world and they grieve us. And we pray for those who are on the front lines, who are seeking technical answers, technical solutions to these problems. We pray for them. We pray that you would give them what they need. That you, would, whether that means funding, or that means insight, or access, or support from the public and governments, whatever that means, Lord, help them. But Father, underneath that and throughout it, we pray for your wisdom. We pray for godliness. We pray for the godly wisdom that would season these people in their technical work and help them to see things that they otherwise wouldn't have seen and to pursue answers that they otherwise wouldn't have sought. Lord, with respect to the pandemic, we thank you, Lord. It's almost as though we've forgotten it on some level, which is strange, but it's true. So we thank you for the people who haven't had the luxury of forgetting it, for the healthcare workers and researchers, uh, for all the people whose lives have been overturned by it. Thank you for their sacrifice, and we pray for the ones who, um, who have been harmed, whether that's physically in terms of the sickness, or that's economically in terms of the shutdown and lost work and lost businesses. We continue to lift them up to you, Lord. We pray for their well-being. We pray for their restoration. Father, with respect to the, the um, racial unrest and tension and, and the reckoning that our nation is going through in many ways, we pray. We pray for national unity. We pray, Lord, that um, the protests would remain mostly peaceful, if not entirely peaceful. I pray that the opportunists whether it's the, the rioters or the looters or the bad political actors on all sides, I pray those opportunists would be silenced, that they would slink into the shadows, and they would be replaced by people who are genuinely seeking justice for all who dwell in our nation. Father, we pray especially for the, for the church, that your people would be the loudest voices in those crowds. Not because we're rabble-rousers, not because we're cantankerous, not because we want to make a show, but because we know what true justice looks like. Because in Christ, your righteousness has been revealed from heaven, and your wrath has been revealed against all sin and unrighteousness. But in Christ, that wrath has been poured out on the cross. So we who are in him live as those who are righteous in your sight. We are justified people, and therefore we should be just people. People who seek justice for our brothers and sisters and our neighbors and our nation. Help us to be those people, Lord. Even if we disagree about the systemic issues involved, even if we disagree about the particular technical solutions, may your wisdom season the way we disagree and the way we pursue those conversations and our willingness to pursue those conversations. Help us, Lord, to shine your light in this. As Stuart reminds us, um, in Houston, they're starting to see a rise in COVID cases. That's true there in California and North Carolina and several other states that we know of so far. We pray for these states, Lord. Um, everybody's got to make decisions in this thing, hard decisions. And leaders have to make the impossible choice between public health in terms of the, the disease and public health in terms of the the consequences of a prolonged 
out uh, lockdown. And it seems either way you look at it, they're going to get it wrong. And people are going to um, criticize. Lord, whether that criticism is earned or unearned, I pray that you would um, uphold these leaders who have to make these decisions, that you would help them not to be paralyzed in the face of them, but to do what they think is best. And I pray that you would surround them with wisdom and expertise and people who could help them to do what is best. And the, for the people in those places, I pray that for the ones who are maybe cavalier towards reopening, that they would be chastened. I pray that they would learn a hard lesson, but even in the learning of that lesson, Lord, you would protect them. And I pray for the rest of us across the nation, we would pay attention, that we wouldn't repeat those mistakes. Lord, again and again, we need your wisdom to shepherd us through these days. So we commend ourselves, we commend our nation, we commend our world into your hands. And we ask, God, that you would continue to move. As always, we pray for your church in this time. May we be a beacon of shining light. May people see in us the peace and comfort and stability and security that they can't find anywhere else in the world right now. And through this, Lord, we pray for revival, first in our own hearts and then in our churches and our communities and our world. May you be glorified even in this tumultuous season, and may Christ's name be exalted above all. And it's in that precious and mighty name that we do pray. Amen. Well, thank you all for joining me this morning. Casey will be back on Thursday morning at 9 a.m. Okay, so that's how we're doing it now. Tuesday and Thursday mornings at 9 a.m. right here on Facebook. It's been a pleasure to be with you today. God bless you all. I'll see you soon.